Okay, so hi everybody. Um, yes, what we're going to be looking at here today is the whole counterculture of the 1960s, as I have here, the rise of the hippies of the 60s in terms of uh, the context, all kinds of things that were going on at that time that really ended up kicking off what's going to become the new spirituality, sometimes called the new consciousness, uh, also called the new age movement. Uh, it's a very extremely important time in, in history. In the 1960s in America, it is uh, of the highest importance. It's, I think it's equivalent to the Enlightenment in terms of the long-term impact on changes in modern society. Okay, it's hugely important. So, oops, there we go. Okay, oh, let me move my face here. So hopefully, I don't know. Um, there's a lot, uh, there was a lot going on. Remember, you know, we had World War I, World War II. And after the World War, uh, America enters into a big boom period. Um, massive production, uh, it's, it's a real, uh, you know, time of growth. Uh, people are able to uh, really get ahead in life, buy a home, start a family. And, uh, and there's the whole baby boomer generation that's going to be born here. Uh, kids born right after the war. And so it's entering into a period of prosperity, massive prosperity in the United States. And coming out of the war as well, were a number of intellectuals that really pondered things spiritually. And here are just a few names. We have Aldo Huxley. He wrote The Perennial Philosophy in 1946 and then The Doors of Perception in 1954. And key things here in The Perennial Philosophy, he put together a type of universalist spirituality. Uh, he kind of you know, promoted the idea of the ancient wisdom uh, concept that we find promoted by Blavatsky in the Theosophical Society. It sort of became a part of the esoteric alternative spiritual tradition in the West, is that there is this universal wisdom uh, that exists, that is really the source of all religions. And it's really uh, quite, it's a lot of key ideas that are held in common. And that's what Huxley spells out in this book, as he highlights the mystical teachings in all the different traditions and how much they have in common. And really, it is um, an orientation to reality that's fundamentally spiritual and also fundamentally universal, that you find it existing across cultures. Okay, So it's kind of a, this universalist spirituality a type of mysticism. Uh, that's that first book. And then the second book, The Doors of Perception, is a result of his altering his state of consciousness. Uh, um, you know, he took some substance. I forget now if it was, uh, I forget now exactly what it was that he took. But uh, he found that our ordinary state of consciousness that we're normally in, it's a very narrow vision of reality that we access in our everyday ordinary consciousness. But by taking a plant substance of some kind, it can just whoo, open the doors of perception. And you'll have a totally different you know, experience of reality and a different perception of what constitutes reality. This is gonna be key for the whole counterculture, is this shift in consciousness through an altered state of consciousness, okay? It's gonna be big, big, big stuff. A similar kind of journey Alan Watts took. Uh, he was a traditional uh, Christian minister, and uh, and again, similar ideas, behold the spirit, uh, advocating the idea of the universality at the mystical level in different religions. And here, just so you can see on the right, uh, we've got Alan Watts down below, and up above is a picture of Huxley. Um, <clears throat> He wrote that to behold the spirit, and then he wrote uh, the supreme identity, the idea that uh, that the essence of one's higher self is divine, and that is something quite universal. That idea that the true self, your higher self, is fundamentally divine. Then he got into Zen Buddhism, okay, and embraced Zen and became a very influential teacher of Zen, and so he kind of left traditional Christianity and got into Buddhism. And, uh, and Buddhism very much got promoted, became very popular in the 50s and onward. And, uh, and so he became an important Zen teacher. And then he also took some kind of a substance that just like Huxley, uh, uh, resulted in his having a profoundly different experience of reality. And that is the essence of his book, The Joyous Cosmology. 
Then we also have here uh, Thomas Merton, who is a Catholic mystic, and he travels to Asia and explores Buddhism and also kind of advocated a bit of a universal approach to spirituality. Okay, and, um, and he unfortunately died while he was, I think it was in Thailand. Uh, while he was doing that. And so we have, you know, these are just highlighting a few big names at the time where they published a number of books. Merton had many books as well. And uh, they were very popular authors uh, prior to the 60s, okay, um, advocating a type of new vision in terms of spirituality that was more universal and eclectic, okay, uh, something quite primal and ancient, shared amongst all traditions, sort of this mystical orientation. And also uh, the importance of altering your state of consciousness, that that is key to actually experiencing these spiritual realities, okay? So what we do find is that there's a hunger for spirituality at the time. And I, yeah, I don't know why this is down there. I wish I would kind of go away. Can you, whoops, uh oh, what happened? Ah, oh, okay, um, what am I loading? Um, pause. <laughs> Okay, what did I do? Exit, exit, exit what? Oh, geez, okay, so here I am. Okay, that's where I am. Okay, good, and okay, present. Okay, here we are back again. And then I want to resume here, okay. All right, Um, I guess that always stays down there. Oh, I see, I can kind of use that. I never realized that. Uh, as I was saying, right down here in 1962, there's a Times article that wrote, uh, uh, the title was Affluent Monasteries. And, and just even here, in terms of traditional religion or Catholicism, uh, many were go entering into the monastic life in the Catholic tradition. There was just such a hunger for spirituality, right? And there's probably various reasons for that, you know, coming out of the war and the devastation of the war, the impact of the war, you know, that, that, that would automatically result in a quest, a search for the meaning of life, the purpose of life, right? Uh, there's this sort of spiritual quest that comes out of that. Uh, then we also are in the time of the Cold War against the, the Soviet Union and communism and the potential threat of a nuclear holocaust. I remember, you know, for me, I'm a baby boomer and in and, and elementary school, you know, sometimes the science iron would go off and you'd have to hide under a table uh, in case an atomic bomb would hit. So there was that sort of anxiety at the time. And, uh, and this is a key thing. And what's going to event eventually develop, as we'll see in the next slide, now why does it take so long to load? Is there a reason for that? Hang on here. Oh, jeez. Um, I'm sorry about this. Why, why? I never had this problem before. Why is it doing this? I'm going to pause again. Why, why is it doing this? Hmm. The beat mix. Well, let's just go there. Loading. Why is it taking so long to load? This is weird. Do I have to pause every time it loads a slide? I can't believe this. I never had this problem before. Loading. Why is it only going here, 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 here? You know what? I wonder if I should just do it like this. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm gonna just uh, do it like this and hopefully you can see it all right. Uh, Cause it seems to always want to load and it takes a long time to load every slide and I don't know why. Uh, anyways, uh, in the fifties, we start seeing major cultural shifts in all kinds of ways, right? As I mentioned, there was this post-war boom, uh, rise of affluence. People were indeed realizing the American dream. And, uh, and what we find here, and I found this interesting, is that there's a, I read an article how there's a shift 
in your approach to a gaining status. I mean, we humans are very tribal, hierarchical kind of beings, <laughs> you know, just like in animals. You know, you've got the alpha male and the wolf pack as to who's number one, the number one dude, uh, who has that higher status of being somebody. This is so central in so many dynamics here with humans is our sense of identity of who am I, right? And we always want to kind of carve out a sense of unique identity, yet at the same time, be part of a tribe. And so what you'll find happening is people will create tribes that they can be a part of, and with that, a sense of identity, and with that sense of identity is one of status, that, hey, I'm with the in crowd instead of the out crowd. And this is something that really starts happening in a different way here in the 50s. Because prior to that, your sense of status was largely one of wealth, Okay. Number two, uh, what was common in high schools was athleticism for boys, you know, that they're on the football team or this team and whatnot. It's like, well, you know, these, you know, these are one of the cool dudes, right? Um, your type of profession, you know, those are sorts of things that would give you a sense of identity. But what starts happening here is the rebel appears. <laughs> and, uh, and so here you've got a, a picture of James Dean in the film Rebel Without a Cause in 1955, that it's a sense of uh, defining yourself as being cool and hip, as being a rebel, in that you reject the American dream and the quest for affluence and materialistic values of having a house, a car, a good job, professionalism, all that regular stuff. Right? This is what really starts happening here, is increasingly amongst the youth, is this quest to acquire a sense of identity as being different, non-conformist. This is going to be huge, uh, kicking off in the 50s onward. Uh, it'll show up in songs by the Beatles. It, you know, it, it'll show up in all kinds of ways in terms of how people dress, act, and whatnot. So we get this birthing of being a rebel, of being outside of mainstream society and challenging uh, the status quo and uh, its uh, materialism and its way of life, the traditional family, father goes to work, mother stays home, cooks and takes care of the kids and all that stuff, right? And, uh, and of course, traditional family life and all those kind of traditional values. And instead, the focus is more of like, oh, being unique, your own unique creative self-expression, <laughs> all right? It's something, and it's something more primal, non-rational. And, and this is what the beatniks were about, were embodying that. And so, you know, just to give you an idea, this is when jazz as a type of music became common and popular. Uh, the type of poetry that the beatniks, uh, they became known as the beatniks, okay, uh, tried to, to compose. They were all these type of rebels. And, and just to give you an example, mainstream society is very rationalistic. There is order, okay, and even in poetry, uh, poetry has an order to it. There's a rhythm and a flow. It has deep rational meaning, okay. Music has a melody. And it's rational, it has order, and there's a flow and a melody to music. Well, here they advocated the opposite, that jazz is just chaotic. You know, it's like you just go with the flow of the moment and do whatever you feel, you know, what's authentic to you in the moment. And it's just whatever, it has no order to it. Same thing with poetry. It's like, it's just, it could be just what a lot of people think is pure crap, <laughs> but it's just non-rational. It doesn't necessarily have to have deep meaning to you. It's like what I just feel like saying in the moment, right? That's the kind of, um, you, this is where this is going, that type of creative self-expression that is almost uh, at war with order, okay? It's rather chaotic. It's being the rebel against the order. And and tied in with that, Zen Buddhism comes into the picture because a lot of these people got it kind of more into Zen Buddhism. And Zen is very similar in that Zen is, uh, is about going beyond the rational, uh, being totally present in the moment and true to the present moment without having that being conditioned and controlled and directed through reason and any kind of objectification and rational analysis, okay? So, and I'm going to just bring this in here because it's all important stuff. You know, for example, in uh, gardening, the Western way of gardening was 
coming out of the Enlightenment largely, he was very rationalistic. There was an order to creating the garden. You know, it'd be like a square. And in the middle, you'd have a big fountain. And in each corner of the square, you'd have a particular type of tree. And then on the edges, you'll have these rose bushes, right? And, and there'd be a harmony of order. It would be more like a geometric pattern because it was all more rationalistic and brought into order. And the idea here is in the West, we impose our rationality. We impose our mind and our thinking upon nature, just as we impose it upon our experience of life by always philosophizing about it and pointing out the meaning of this and the meaning of that. And then we put that into a poem and we make the poem not just rational in terms of the meaning that we expound upon through the use of reason, but we also put it in order in terms of the rhythm and the flow and that it rhymes, <laughs> you know, and all that sort of stuff. Whereas in Zen, it's the opposite. Okay. In Zen, you just go with nature, the flow of what is. Instead of imposing a rationalistic order on nature, it's just allowing the flow of it to be as it is and being present to the moment of it. Same thing with haiku poetry and Zen poetry, you know, is to capture that raw essence of the experience. You know, a uh, frog jumps out of pond, splashing water, sound of splashing water, ta-da, that's it for a haiku poem. There's no rationalizing about it, no philosophizing about it. You just want to capture the present moment as is without rationalization. Okay. Anyways, I'm kind of going off here on this, uh, but it's something, again, a lot of people just don't realize. Uh, this is a lot of what's going on here is um, this uh, a primal kind of commitment to authenticity of being present in the moment to your true self and you can throw rationality out the door. You can throw order out the door. It's just freedom of expression. <clears throat> and there's pros and cons to everything, okay? There's pros and cons to everything. But this is what's going on. And this is what the beatniks, they were the forerunners of this, kind of paving the way for a new way of being, uh, a, a new value system, a new orientation to how to live, right? And what's going to be important here? And it's going to be your own authentic self-expression. It's going to be so key to the whole um, uh, ambience, the, the geist of the counterculture. Okay, so anyways, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> these are some of the big names here. James Dean, as you see here in The Rebel, uh, but he died you know, prematurely. Uh, you have here at the bottom right, Allen Ginsberg, <laughs> be poet, as along with Michael McClure, who just died actually just a couple of, a few weeks ago. He passed on, and Bob Dylan and Robbie Rob Robertson, both musicians uh, that got into this, but then of course they went their own way and didn't do the whole jazz route. Uh, but another thing to realize here, what's really important for what kicks off here is how virtually every home now had a television set. You know, TV was still a relatively new thing, right? And uh, very limited programming still, but now it was coming into every home and that's gonna have a huge impact. If there was no TV, you know, we'd be in a different world today, I can tell you that. Anyway, to move on here, <clears throat> So as I mentioned here, we have uh, <clears throat> the Beatniks here. It's a social literary movement of the 50s. Uh, they're pro-Zen. A lot of times they call themselves the hip cats. Hep. And then with that kind of being hip and cool, and that's where eventually the word hippie seems to come from. Okay. And so in their whole approach, you know, to jazz and poetry and whatnot, they also then embrace a different style of dress, which was, again, a type of rebellion. Okay, and so that everybody had, and you've got to watch some of the videos that I've got listed, but they all, you know, traditionally people, all the guys, for example, all had short hair, would wear a suit and tie, even going to school in high school, uh, very, dressed very prim and proper the way businessmen normally would be today. That's how they just dressed, going to high school, for example, okay? Well, here they advocated, you know, just let your hair grow long, you know, go natural, <laughs> you know, let your hair grow long, growing beards. It was like, whoa, that was totally foreign. And then uh, wearing blue jeans. Now, blue jeans, those were the type of pants that ranchers and farmers were. They were the working men's pants, you know, out on a ranch that, you know, hauling bales of hay, hay, bales of hay that you wouldn't tear your pants. You would not wear nice pants. Uh, they were hardcore working pants. 
So they'd wear those, jeans. And so jeans became popular. Instead of regular shoes, they wore sandals. So they made that popular. And so they start to have this whole look about them, okay? And that became kind of bohemian, uh, anarchistic in, in flavor. And, um, and so anyways, as I said here, hippies uh, grew out of this, a term that started to, uh, showing up a lot in the mid 60s, seemed to come from hip cat being hip, cool, not square, all that sort of stuff. And as a movement, as we'll see, uh, they're very much into altering states of consciousness. And LSD becomes a big thing, but you know, taking mushrooms and various substances is, is a huge factor. And they were, you know, as we already mentioned, some of the authors here, this was just a new thing coming in that gets promoted more and more. And it's gonna be a movement that's gonna be protesting Vietnam War and uh, protesting freedom of sex and, and to make love, not war. The birth control pill gets uh, is created here and that's going to be widely available and that's going to allow greater uh, sexual expression, okay? Um, anyways, being very creative, as I've already mentioned, living in communes, you know, getting back to nature, going green, saving the planet. You know, these are all the kinds of themes that are going to be showing up here. Okay. But how uh, there are a number of factors that come into play here in, in the whole context of the 60s. And it begins first here too with the social activism that starts with uh, under the leadership of Martin Luther King, uh, often known as the civil rights movement that started in the 50s. And it gains increasing momentum. And it was violently opposed. Right. And I'll show some pictures here in a sec. <clears throat> and a key thing is that for probably a lot of us here today, we don't realize, but in parts of the deep south in the United States, segregation was the norm. So that in a lot of schools, for example, there would be an area in the cafeteria, in the school cafeteria, that this area was designated for blacks and this other area designated for whites. Uh, riding a bus, the blacks had to go on the back of the bus and the whites would be at the front of the bus. Uh, there were universities, blacks were not allowed, churches, blacks were not allowed. You know, they had their own separate, uh, some schools, universities, churches, what have you, have you. Uh, and public parks in various areas, washrooms for blacks only and, and those for white for only. So you had that kind of segregation in place, okay, in certain parts of the deep south, not all of America, but in, in the deep south, right? Mississippi, Alabama, etc. And, um, and with that also, though, uh, there were issues about voting rights because most Blacks were illiterate and they wouldn't be able to write, and so then they couldn't really have the right to vote. Uh, there was a lot of discrimination in terms of employment. You know, there are a lot of issues. And so, um, uh, with Martin Luther King calling for the ending of this kind of segregation, uh, this then brought about that John F. Kennedy, he was a president at the time, he was going to uh, introduce new legislation, uh, uh, the Civil Rights Act, that would indeed guarantee equal rights for racial minorities and bring an end to this kind of segregation and any kind of discrimination like this. And, uh, and so at first, uh, King is very much opposed and there's, you know, I think, you know, where he is gets bombed and he gets thrown in jail and I'll show it some videos or slides here in, in the next slide. But at first there's a lot of opposition and reaction against King and his movement. And, uh, and again, it starts spreading where people all over the place supported him because of the television. They could see what was going on in other places. And a lot of Americans were shocked that the blacks were so poorly treated in certain areas that they had no idea that this was going on. And, um, and so there'd be, you know, peaceful protests, sit-ins, you know, where, you know, blacks and whites are linked up together, sitting together to protest here and there, or marching together, or entering a bus together, uh, linked together, just taking a stand against this kind of segregation. And, uh, and then it culminates in uh, King uh, gaining great support, has this massive march here in Washington with 200,000 people where he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech in August of 1963, okay? But then that fall in November is when John F. Kennedy gets assassinated, right? Uh, but then after that, it, the Civil Rights Act does get indeed passed in 64, around this time of year, the uh, end of June, early July. Uh, so just to give you a bit of an idea here in this slide, in Birmingham, when uh, this was called the uh, Child Children's Crusade, 
where King was uh, leading a peaceful protest march. And he was a he was a minister. Okay, he was a Christian minister, and um, and most of uh, his supporters were Christians. It was very much a quite a large, strong Christian kind of movement in a sense, and they would be on their knees praying and uh, uh, peacefully calling for their uh, the removal of this kind of segregation and prejudice. Well, the mayor of Birmingham absolutely was so opposed to all of this came out in a heavy hand against it to stop this protest and you can see here there were images and it was all on tv of dogs attacking people uh they're spraying fire hoses on women and children who were kneeling in prayer just spraying them with fire hoses uh king and others got thrown into jail and uh and it created quite an uproar it shocked people to see this kind of reaction by the city officials against this peaceful protest, not like what we're seeing today. There was no looting, no violence, okay? They were just peacefully marching down the street, singing songs and, and praying. And, uh, and there was this violent backlash against them. Well, that ended up uh, coming into uh, King's favor. He became a hero after this, uh, was uh, released from prison, and the mo movement gained momentum. And then after this is when he led that uh, massive march in Washington. Okay? But it was a pretty violent, dark period. Um, so anyways, tied in with that, this is a little bit separate, but just so you're aware, in the 60s as well, there are various riots, uh, race riots that took place, largely within black communities and largely instigated within the black community. And again, these are just a few quotes just to give you an idea. It's so similar to what we're seeing today. Uh, in Detroit in 1967, uh, as you can see here, we have, we're among the most violent and disruptive riots, excuse me, in US history. Hmm. But who knows what you'd say about what's going on today. Uh, by the time the bloodshed, burning, and looting ended after five days, 43 people were dead, 342 injured, 1,400 buildings burned, some 7,000 National Guard U.S. Army troops called into service. Okay, and here you can just see a picture of a woman in front of a store, a you know, black woman in her community, where everything got vandalized, looted, destroyed. Uh, it was a lot of dark things going on. Then you had the Watts riots in Los Angeles in August of 65, <clears throat> again, 34 dead, tens of millions of dollars of damage that was done, okay, based on an identity check by police on two black men that just sparked it. And uh, then after the assassination of King in Memphis, Tennessee, violence erupts in 125 cities in uh, April of 1968, okay, which again, left 46 dead, 2,600 injured, right? And, uh, and that was, uh, so there's a lot of civil unrest here within the black community uh, that really got also triggered at this time. And, you know, it, it's, as we're seeing, that's happening today. Okay, so we have this civil rights movement kicking off, calling for equal rights, okay, and to stop the segregation of blacks. And indeed, it was successful. Uh, then we have John F. Kennedy getting assassinated in the fall of 63, November. And people, you know, this was absolutely shocking to the world. It's like the whole world came to a standstill. I remember that as a little girl seeing that on TV and I just felt this, oh, dark cloud over this uh, happening, that this was something really bad and, and, and scary. And uh, yeah, and then of course, there's a lot of conspiracy theories around that and questions about that, you know, with Kennedy and yeah, and I think probably a good reason for that. But anyway, then also, just so you're aware, um, King, Martin Luther King himself, also gets assassinated in 1968, along also with Robert Kennedy, a brother of John F. Kennedy. And so this was a very intense time of these assassinations of leading figures in America, uh, unheard of to this extent, okay? Uh, it was very disturbing for people as to what on earth is going on. Things are being shaken to the core here. And then we also have the, the Vietnam War kicking off in 1965, going on for 10 years. And that leads to a huge amount of protests all over uh, America and beyond. And uh, again, really a lot of good video material for you guys to watch on this so you can really get a sense as to the climate of the time. And, uh, and eventually, at first, the, the protests were more peaceful. They become increasingly violent over time. And they get taken over more and more by a radical left, uh, a hardcore kind of radicals on the left that became very violent. 
And that just triggered off huge uh, violence. And it finally kind of started to die down after the death of a number of students. In uh, 1970, four students died at Kent State and another two at Jackson State University. Okay, and here I think I have that on the next slide. I have some pictures. So yeah, so here, as I mentioned, at first the, pro the protests were more peaceful. Here, there's just students lying here on front of a, a, a cap of state capitol building. And, uh, and you can see here, you know, they're still pretty clean cl cut, ordinary kind of kids. Uh, but huge numbers started to gather protesting. Even in Washington, a massive protest took place, okay? And then here's a picture of the four uh, students that were killed at uh, Kent State University that became really, really ugly, okay? Yeah, so these were tragic times for this. Now, among, again, this is all on the social activism kind of side of things here, okay? So you've got the civil rights movement for racial minority, the protesting the Vietnam War, Okay, uh, you had a lot of draft dodgers, you know, the draft got put in place. So all young men were forced to had to become a, a soldier to fight over in Vietnam. And we have a lot of them coming over to Canada at that time, you know, dodging the draft if they could. Um, so you have all that going on. Well, then what kicks off in the late 60s into the 70s are is other forms of activism. We have the women's rights movement uh, uh, kicking off for women calling for equality in terms of pay and whatnot. And then the gay rights movements, okay, in terms of, and I think you can maybe read, let me just see if I can make this bigger. Yeah, there we go. Um, <clears throat> You can see here, you know, in terms of no longer criminalizing homosexual engagement, okay, and homosexuality, but that they have rights um, and, and should be protected. And then also then the whole green movement, environmentalism, and the animal rights, it expands even to that, okay, expands into that. So we've got a huge amount of social activism going on here at this time, okay. And the impact of this is a, it challenges uh, American value system. And it's saying that there's something wrong in America here where we are not honoring the rights of racial minorities, gays, women, the planet and animals, and the rights of communists, uh, the rights of other countries and their political choices that they make. Okay, if they're going to be communist or not, right? Uh, that we don't respect the rights of others. And, and that instead, what's underneath this is going to be the idea that the rights of all must be protected because there needs to be a reverence for all of life as sacred that everyone is equal, that there's a oneness to life, a unity amongst humanity, a unity of all of life, and that life itself must be revered and honored and protected. That's really kind of the undertone underneath it, even though that isn't always spelled out. But what's going to happen here is people are going to want to have a worldview, a paradigm, a model of reality okay, that will support that fundamental value that all of life is sacred, okay. <clears throat> that's kind of an idea that's going on here. Hopefully that makes sense, okay. All right. <clears throat> well then, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, the discovery of LSD, okay, lysergic acid in 1938. Uh, by somebody else, uh, Albert Hoffman. And um, Timothy Leary was at the time a, uh, you know, as a PhD in psychology, he was a prof, a professor over at Harvard. He becomes a major advocate for taking LSD, okay? And he held that this was the fast track to enlightenment. And, uh, and he worked with Allen Ginsberg and others, you know, various intellectuals and artists at the time to promote it. Now, what happens here for him is he got turned on to this because of his experience uh, in Mexico in 1960, where I think he took uh, some peyote. And he held that in the four hours while he was on this altered state of consciousness trip, that he learned more about the mind, about psychology, than he did all of his graduate studies at Harvard. And he got totally turned on to the use of LSD for therapeutic purposes and for spiritual enlightenment. And so he hooked up with Ralph Metzner and Richard Alpert, uh, who also were, uh, I'm not sure if Ralph Metzner was a prophet at Harvard, but Alpert was. 
and uh, they would do research on students at Harvard. Um, they uh, were told by the university that they had to stop and they refused to, they still kind of would do it, and then they got fired. And eventually, uh, Leary had to flee the police, uh, went to, lived in Mexico for a while, he was sort of on the run, <laughs> uh, whatnot, because uh, he would be, uh, eventually LSD became illegal in 1966. Okay, uh, but an interesting experiment that he did with some others at Boston University in 1962 was known as the Good Friday Experiment. Excuse me, where they had, uh, it was Good Friday in the chapel at the university. They had some of the students take LSD and the others, I think it was, excuse me, uh, I shouldn't drink water, it makes me burp, sorry. Some of them took uh, the LSD and others just took a placebo. And, uh, and they found, and then they'd interviewed them after the Good Friday service. And uh, for most of them, they had said they had the most profound spiritual experience as a result of having taken LSD and, and then having the Good Friday service. And then they did a follow-up study in the 90s with these same people. And, uh, and most of them said that, uh, indeed, that was one of the most important spiritual experiences in their whole life. They still very much honored, revered uh, that experience that they had here at the, uh, in the Good Friday experiment. Anyways, that's all kind of interesting stuff. Now, uh, so Timothy Leary, uh, as you'll see in some videos, you know, uh, he starts promoting acid as a way of spiritual enlightenment. He and uh, Albert, uh, they put together a book called The Psychedelic Experience. And they use the Tibetan Book of the Dead as sort of a, a bit of a model, a guidelines for how to guide you in the LSD experience and to awaken to spirituality through this. Um, and, uh, and Richard Alpert, he ends up going to India in his spiritual quest. It's like LSD opened him up to spirituality and he thought he wanted to go deeper. So he goes to India in 1967, studies under a guru and comes back to America later on as Ram Das and functions pretty much as a type of spiritual guru himself and wrote a number of books. One of his most famous and well-known books at the time was Be Here Now, <laughs> you know, be present here now. And so, you know, you've got Eckhart Tolle here in Vegas. Vancouver, who, I don't know, it was 10 years ago now, I'm not too sure. He wrote The Power of Now, nothing new, okay? Uh, that's classic uh, mystic teachings, okay? Ram Das said the same way back in, in around, I think, 70. Um, so anyway, so there you go. That's just some of that. This really kicks off. Whoops, now why is it doing that? Let me just kind of uh, hang on here. I want to go there, okay. So the whole psychedelic scene really opened people up to spirituality. It's huge, okay, cannot be overstated. And what we have then happening at the same time as this is going on with people taking LSD, we have an influx of spiritual teachers coming from the East, okay. In 1965, there was a change in the immigration policy. Uh, the Oriental Exclusion Act was rescinded. Okay, which then allowed for immigration from Asia. And this is when a lot of spiritual teachers and various gurus started coming over to America at this time, right? And so this is when the Hare Krishnas get established, uh, where Swami Prabhupada, he came over to New York in 1966, you know, with like $5 in his pocket and starts gathering a following uh, around him where people start chanting Hare Krishna, uh, becoming vegetarian. Uh, the Beatles got into this. Remember one of the songs of... Um, George Harrison, uh, my sweet Lord, you know, he goes, my sweet Lord, and it's Hare Krishna, <laughs> okay, uh, and then we also have uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi there with Transcendental Meditation becoming widely popular, and the Beatles hung out with him and, 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 and got into meditation and stuff, uh, huge, uh, Yogi Bhajan there, as you can see, with the turban, uh, the 3HO is the Healthy, Happy, Holy Organization had also a huge impact, started building yoga centers all over the place. And here in Vancouver on 4th Avenue, that's one of those that was, I don't know how old it is, but it's very old. It's right there at the time of the counterculture was put in place. Huge impact, introducing people to yoga, specifically Kundalini yoga and meditation and chanting, uh, devotional chanting. Uh, all this stuff now starts coming in. And so what was a common kind of experience for people, is, you know, they would go to a party, they would go to some kind of psychedelic gathering, and there'd be some LSD Kool-Aid that they would drink. 
and it would have a profound impact normally in our everyday state of consciousness. Here, I'm gonna just stop share for a sec. Okay, yeah. You know, in our ordinary everyday state of consciousness, we have clear sense of boundaries of me, myself here, my body being separate from the world out there. Uh, a sense of past, present, future, boundaries in terms of time, a sense of boundaries of what's right and what's wrong, true and false. Uh, they're very clearly defined boundaries. That's how we are in our normal, you know, I like to call it the objective mode of consciousness, okay, or the left brain hemisphere that's dominant. And, uh, but then in taking, uh, you know, often in an altered state, but taking a kind of plant substance, something like LSD or, or hallucinogen or entheogen, you know, various terms that are used here, that all of a sudden it's those boundaries start to fade. Okay, they just start to fade and things become blurry. <laughs> and that sense of division. And my sense of self can seem to expand. And it's like I become one with the room around me or one with the tree that I'm next to. And it's like, as I'm breathing, I can just feel, whew, you know, everything breathing around me. And I just feel as though I am that tree and the process of photosynthesis is going through my body, like blood circulating through my veins. And I just have this sense of expansion and merging and blending with what's around me, right? Those boundaries fade. And then the sense of time, you know, it was past and present and future, those boundaries, they fade. And it's like, it's just, it's all an eternal now. <laughs> all right. There is no time. You transcend time. It's the eternal now is sort of the term, right? That gets used. And then everything just radiates. The colors are more vibrant and everything just seems more alive and rich and deep. And, and you're just in a sense of awe about everything. It's like, wow, it's all mind blowing. Right? And you just look at the simplest of things. And, and what was just, you just took it for granted is the, you know, the grains here and, and the wood. It's like, well, it means nothing. But now all of a sudden you look at the grains of the wood and it's like, whoa, you know, this is the secret of the universe is right here. It's got a, the message to me right now in the grains of the, it's speaking to me. Right? And you see such a profound message. Uh, 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 there, there's such a sense of profound truth. And then this is a deeper reality. And so people have this experience that God is in everything and all is one, all right? And that this is ultimate reality. And it's like, wow, mind blowing. And then, you know, it starts to wear off. It starts to wear off and you come back into your ordinary consciousness. And it's like, oh, wow, you know, this world, this ordinary world of ordinary, it's like, this is not real. This is a shadow. When you're in an altered state on that LSD, it's like, wow, that is ultimate reality, right? That seems to be a higher reality, the true reality. And this is just a mere shadow of that reality. Profound shift in, in, in people's experience of reality and what they start to think about reality. And so from this experience, they then go onto campus or wherever and they hear a lecture by a guru saying, oh, dear people, you know, don't you know that all is one and all is God. I am God. You are God. Everything is God. And we are all one, right? Uh, sort of classic Vedantic philosophy or something. Right? And it's like, bang up, man, I get what he's talking about. That's exactly what I experienced on LSD last weekend, right? Whereas the next person say, you know, if you tell your mother this when you go home or whatever, and she'd think, what are you nuts? You're not the tree. The tree isn't God. God is up there in heaven. What are you talking about? You know, it makes no sense. It makes no sense to somebody who is still in their ordinary state of consciousness with their everyday experience of reality at this level. It's like, that seems totally irrational and makes absolutely no sense, right? Whereas for the person who had experienced it through the, you know, induction of an altered state, oh, they get it. They get it, okay? It's a huge, huge, huge factor in all of this, okay? And so you find, uh, where am I here? I want to share a screen again. So you find happening here is, uh, now how did I do this here? Over here. Uh, is that... Um, 
there is uh, what many call a massive turning east. <laughs> you know, Harvey Cox, uh, he wrote a book, he was from Harvard way back, of uh, the turning east that happens as a result of this. Uh, the uh, a psychedelic scene, the, the ingestion of LSD and other substances uh, that combined with the exposure to Eastern philosophy and any kind of mystical teachings, could be the Sufis, the mystics of Islam, could be Christian mysticism, Jewish mysticism, any kind of mystical teachings. It's like, whoa, things really start intersecting here okay, and becomes uh, very influential. And then, of course, in all this, we have the Beatles. And here, I just like this picture because you can kind of see the before and after. <laughs> you know, the very beginning of the Beatles, you know, they start kicking off in 1960 and uh, they started to grow their hair a little bit long, not too short, right? I mean, not short, but not too long either, but just a little bit longer than others. And again, you got to watch all those videos I've got. Uh, it's really, really worth seeing. And but still, they wore a suit and tie in the very first beginning of their performances. But as time goes on, the influence of the whole psychedelic scene and turning east themselves and getting into meditation and Eastern philosophy, uh, look at the whole psychedelic clothing, right? Very colorful, right? And that's what, again, with psychedelics, you know, taking uh, uh, an entheogen or hallucinogen, a plant substance that shifts your consciousness, okay? Uh, this is a huge thing is colors start showing up. Colors, everything's, the colors are so vibrant. And then geometric patterns is very common. And that's why the clothing took on uh, uh, aspects of the psychedelic experience, the colors and geometric patterns. Okay. So they uh, promote a lot of these ideas in their songs and in their music. And again, this is the first time we have because of t television and you know radio, the use of radio, music, albums beginning, uh, you know this starts really kicking off that you get a whole youth subculture emerging where they all share a similar taste in music. It's like they're, they have a sense of identity as being part of a group that was different from their parents. You get this the first time, this sense of a generation gap, a separation from the older generation, that they embody a different kind of lifestyle, a different value system, okay? They listen to different kind of music, uh, you know, all kinds of things. You, you find this gelling like this. And of course, it culminates, you know, in Woodstock in New York in 1969, this huge mega music festival of over 400,000 people. Okay, as a gathering. I mean, it's just a sea of people here. That was huge, where you get all those famous artists. I don't think I have a picture of those artists, but yeah, it's great stuff. You know, Jimi Hendrix, uh, The Doors, uh, Eric Clapton, Joan Baez, um, you know, all kinds of people. Uh, I don't know if the Grateful Dead were there, but a lot of these key musicians at that time, they're all linked. They're kind of linked with the beatniks, you know, Allen Ginsberg, Timothy Leary, you know, like they all kind of had their connections, okay? Hmm. <clears throat> well, what also happens at this time is that there is all this spiritual quest that goes on. There also is, an, again, I'm taking a title from a book. Uh, somebody wrote a book called The Occult Explosion Kicks Off in the 70s. With this fascination of spirituality, there's also this fascination with the paranormal, okay? And with what's often called the more Western esoteric metaphysical teachings. Things like exploring reincarnation, channeling, can I contact spirits and communicate with other intelligences, you know, through channeling and whatnot. Psychic development, right? Developing my psychic abilities, working with magic, various divination techniques, astral traveling, working with energy. All right. So all this sort of stuff starts to really, really explode. And, uh, and people are fascinated with this. And this is the kind of stuff that you don't get at church on Sundays. Okay. Um, you know, we take it for granted what you find in the bookstore today, even though a lot of them are closing down, you go to Amazon. But back in the 1950s, if you went to a bookstore, you could hardly ever find any kind of a book on Eastern philosophy, Eastern religions, yoga, meditation, divination, channeling, you know, any of this kind of stuff. No, you won't find any of this stuff. Most of the books were simply copies of the Bible, uh, Christian books, uh, you know, things by the evangelist Billy Graham, you know, who was very popular. Uh, that's about it. Very limited pickings. Okay. And it's after the 60s, actually, it's because of the 60s that universities started to open up departments of religious studies. 
at UBC, it opened up in the 60s. It, a lot of colleges got birthed in the 60s, like even Douglas College got birthed at this time in the 60s, okay? It's now 50 years old. Um, you know, you'll have that, or I guess in the 70s, 1970. I gotta just cross my leg here. Um, because people were hungry for the study of other religions, other forms of spirituality. They weren't content with just traditional going to church on Sunday stuff. Okay, they wanted to know more about well, how can all this stuff work? How, what, how, what does it all mean? What are we to make of all these things? Okay, all the spooky stuff of life. <laughs> okay, and uh, and so boom, it just explodes the fascination and people wanting to explore it and get into it. And so, <clears throat> an idea that became popular at this time is that we are entering into the age of Aquarius. Okay, and that was a hit song, uh, you know. My voice is so croaky. Uh, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. You know that song? And it goes on. When the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars. Oh, I used to be able to sing. Then peace will guide the planets and love will steer the stars. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Oh, dear. I'll have to delete this. Um, so this song was a big hit. And the message here, and it's not just a message. In astrology, uh, we travel through a particular zodiac sign for a period of 2,000 years. So for the last 2,000 years, we've been in the sign of Pisces. And we're now moving in. Our plan is for the next 2,000 years under the sign of Aquarius. And the idea here is that Aquarius represents a new age for humanity that we're entering into, an age of peace and universal brotherhood, universal enlightenment, where there'll be a harmony. We'll all get together and love each other, <laughs> okay? Uh, a period of peace and harmony and enlightenment. And uh, that that is the new age that we're entering into. And that's where, you know, it got the, uh, uh, the name of a new age movement. Okay. And, um, and so uh, <clears throat> the hippies of the 60s, they believed that they were at the forefront, uh, leading the way, birthing forth this new age in human history that uh, as they created and formed their own communes and, and different way of living, that they were kind of leading the way as to what it would mean to be living as enlightened people, uh, a people in harmony with nature, in harmony with each other, living in peace, living in love, living from a different value system, not guided by materialism, but guided by spirituality, right? That they were the forerunners of this, okay? And what you also have, just so you know at this time, uh, you also have the Jesus movement kicking off. So just as there's this fascination and interest in spirituality, there were those hippies that instead, they got into this Jesus dude, all right, that he was the hip one. <laughs> and, uh, and it was sort of like a spiritual awakening in a Christian sense. And what came out of that is the birthing of some musicals. The most popular big hit was Jesus Christ Superstar. Okay, a type of rock op or rock opera, oh, rock, ro rock, opera, 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 I'm saying opera, Renfri, opera, uh, it was a big hit in 1967, and uh, no, no, 1970, and the musical Hair uh, of 1967, the musical Hair had the song The Age of Aquarius, and then of course, you know, give me more of that hair, long hair, you know, let grow, <laughs> it's a great song, anyway, so this all kicks off. You have the Jesus movement as well. So that was sort of like they formed their own alternative. Um, uh, they had their kind of hippie way of, of being Christian and uh, how they kind of, um, you know, yeah, embodied kind of parts of the counterculture, but also, you know, in, in their own kind of Christian way. So you had that happening as well. Okay. Especially out in Berkeley, it really kicks off. A lot of this stuff kicks off in Berkeley, in San Francisco. Whew, then... Yeah, good, okay. We also have, at this time, as a part of all of this, is the, uh, the growth of the holistic health movement, okay? And I'm just going to go to the next slide. Can I do that? Yeah. Holistic health. Here, it's uh, holistic health in that they, they held that we need to, for truly becoming healed and being healthy and whole, we need to treat body, mind, and spirit the whole of the human being. Uh, 
And this is where uh, they were very much opposed, not they were opposed, but they felt that mainstream medicine, okay, was very limited. It just looked at you as, as a biochemical entity and biochemical machine. You got a problem, oh, well, let's put some drugs in you to fix that chemistry, and then, oh, something else mechanically wrong, let's do surgery. Okay, surgery, drugs, end of story. You're just this piece of meat, okay, that is, uh, uh, can be brought into, quote, health uh, through drugs and surgery. Right? And they have, no, 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 no. There's so much more to a human being and what it means to be healthy. And holistic health then in, uh, advocated the treating of the whole person okay, body, mind, and spirit. And also tied in with that is aspects of natural healing and alternative healing. So they advocated that the old traditional forms of healing, like Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine, right? A lot of indigenous people had their own healing methods of working with plants, right? Herbal kind of medicinal treatments, right? The use of herbs and natural supplements. Uh, and then with this, increasingly maybe working with energy, all right, uh, in various ways. And so energy healing and things like qigong and acupressure, uh, puncture and acupressure and massage and all kinds of things like that come into play. And also that you should eat organic foods and promoting organic gardening and bringing healing to the planet by living in a healthy way that is in harmony with nature, okay? And so this is where this whole focus on organic foods and organic farming and composting and, and being against a pollution of the environment, uh, uh, living in a more healthy, natural way, right? All this gets kicked off here. And with it, again, in its stance against materialism, but also for the quest of health and well-being, uh, that you know we should share our resources. So co-op housing, co-op stores, uh, co-op cars. You know, like what we have now. You know, eco cars or whatever they're called, where you have you know share a car. Uh, the, all this developed back then. Okay, um, the, where the stores would be like a co-op store where the community owns that store and everybody has would have to put in so many hours of work at that store. And, uh, and it was, again, by the community, for the community, of the community. So you had all these sorts of things going on. And this would very much then tie in with, you know, many living in communes and setting up communes uh, as a different way of living and uh, as an alternative to what was going on in mainstream society. Okay, So this is huge, the whole holistic health movement and alternative forms of healing. Okay. Uh, yeah, and so here, because the, then, two key thing is they bring in the spiritual, they bring in the emotional and mental, you know, and also the social that you need relationships and connections and love, and and how how you know you are relationally to others that that will affect your health. Okay, and then uh, to how we live on the planet that we need to bring healing to the planet, as you can see here, instead of destroying it, um, and it kind of ties in then with the whole e ecology movement that kicks off. Okay, boy, uh, it's getting kind of long. Mm, there's a lot, so much material on all this. So then we also have kicking off here uh, in the 60s, oops, uh, let me go back one slide here, is uh, the human potential movement. Okay, the human potential movement. And let me, do I have it on this slide here? Yeah, I'm gonna, the human potential movement, let me just kind of go here first. What happens is that many psychologists had become disillusioned, as you can see here, with mainstream psychology. Mainstream psychology was strictly either behaviorist or Freudian psychoanalysis. So, so just as people were dissatisfied with mainstream medicine, that treated you as just a biochemical entity, that you're just this mass of bone and matter. There's nothing more to you than matter, really, okay? You're just a material entity. Same thing in psychology where, you know, there's nothing spiritual about you at all. You are simply a product of your environment in terms of behaviorism. You're a product of both your genes, your genetic makeup determine, you know, who you're, what you're like, what kind of diseases you'll get, sicknesses you'll get, uh, your personality, and your environment, your environmental upbringing. You're just simply a product of your environment and genes, period. 
And so you can then be manipulated simply through environmental controls. Uh, and, and literally, the hardcore behaviors even didn't think there was such a thing. There is no such thing as mind. There is no such thing as consciousness. You are strictly this material entity, and what you call mind or free will or your consciousness are just behavior patterns. They're just behavior patterns. And those behavior patterns are determined by your genes and your environment. There's nothing more to you than that, okay? Uh, and so that's behaviorism, right? That in terms of behavior psychology, and that was dominant. So you can see here, there's no place for anything spiritual or transcendent to the self. Then you had Freud. And his psychoanalysis. And he had, oh, no, no, you've got something deeper in the psyche, the unconscious, <laughs> okay? Uh, but it's largely uh, the cause and source of all your neurotic behaviors. Uh, it's uh, the, the hotbed and, and the, uh, the well that contains all your suppressed sexual emotions, largely sexual desires and drives, okay? And so he had a very narrow view of the unconscious, okay? And so a lot of psychologists were kind of really disappointed with the very limited model of what a human being consisted of and, and who we all are was so limited that they were very dissatisfied with that. And so they wanted to explore other ways. And of course, Carl Jung did way back uh, where he used to work with Freud and he went his own way by saying, oh yes, there is indeed the unconscious, but it isn't just about you know, our neurotic uh, suppressed sexual desires. There's way more to it. And Jung opened the door that within the personal unconscious, there's also the way it connects to a larger pool or ocean of collective unconscious. And that there is something profoundly spiritual in that. And he held that religion was of value, spirituality is of value, because at the deepest core, in a sense, we're fundamentally spiritual in nature. Mm. Okay, <clears throat> kind of put it that way. Excuse me. <coughs> Anyway, <clears throat> my voice goes all the time now. <clears throat> so a whole bunch of people like Abraham Maslow and others started to emphasize that there's a need, okay, going here on the slide, a need for a more comprehensive model of the self, okay? That we need uh, an understanding of human psychology that would include that we have a higher potential of some kind that's fundamentally spiritual in nature, okay? Just, Put it rather loosely and many followed suit and this opened the door for psychology to start to blend in with spirituality okay and more and more gave voice to the idea that we uh should heed the call to actualize our higher potential that's why it becomes known as the human potential movement that uh, the human journey is one of growth uh, of development of actualizing our full potential our higher potential and to become aware of our higher self, that there is something within us that's bigger than our everyday conscious self, <clears throat> okay, and that we could tap into that. And that is all what the human journey is about. <clears throat> and here I just have to uh, highlight here Jean Houston. There are many people in this camp, okay? But Jean Houston was a big name. She's written tons of books. And she has two doctorates, one in psychology and another one in religion. <clears throat> And she actually, way back in the 60s, began research on LSD and from there went on to explore the depths of human consciousness, all right, in terms of myth, mythology, and whatnot. Um, and so coming out of that, when we then have people who developed personal growth centers, and these were places where they would explore these kinds of topics, all right? And this is sort of what was involved in the human potential movement are all these personal growth centers that get set up. And the most popular and well-known is that of the Esalen Institute. It is the first personal growth center that's located in Big Sur, California. <clears throat> <coughs> Had to pause for a bit. Um, so where was it here? Yeah. So the uh, Esalen Institute in California, there's also others we have here uh, on one of the islands off of Vancouver Island, uh, the Hollyhock is such an institute, uh, the Omega Institute in New York. Uh, these are sort of the three biggies here in North America where they're retreat centers and they will bring in uh, teachers, speakers, intellectuals from you know, various ways, but generally in the area of spirituality psychology, okay? And, uh, and the goal there is largely for you to expand and grow 
in, in various ways, um, to develop yourself in, in various dimensions, you know, psychologically, emotionally, physically, you know, sometimes it'd be things like on Taoism, um, sex therapy, Tantra, um, you know, all kinds of things. And what we find here is this, it's a type of spirituality that is zeros around and, and revolves around the idea of developing yourself, realizing your higher potential, expanding your sense of self, right, into more transcendental kind of ways, and, um, and freeing yourself from emotional blocks, physical blocks, so you're just totally free to be who you are, right, with joy and um, vibrancy vibrancy and so there's a lot involved here but uh, a key thing that happens this is a key thing that happens a lot of traditional spiritual practices get taken out of the traditional religious context okay and they're now used for other purposes so classic example is buddhist meditation yoga <laughs> okay uh you know these things are not done anymore so that oh i'm doing my buddhist meditation because i want to attain nirvana and become enlightened uh, you know attain bodhi and become enlightened the way the buddha was no people do buddhist meditation for various reasons to deal with anger issues to reduce anxiety and stress uh promote their health just to feel more connected with themselves and with life uh maybe to get inspirations all right, you know, for various purposes, and really not at all for the hardcore traditional classic uh, po focus for Buddhist meditation was to attain nirvana, to attain enlightenment, right? It's like not that. Same thing with yoga. You know, yoga traditionally, classically, what it was used for is again to attain samadhi, you know, their form of enlightenment. And so that you'd be released from rebirth. That is the end goal, to be released from rebirth. So again, the practice is taken out of a traditional religious context and is now done for various purposes, for your individual well-beingness that you are healthier, you are more at peace, uh, you are more integrated, uh, you're more free to express yourself, you are more authentic to who you really are instead of being a conditioned product of your environment. Okay? So there's a lot that goes on here. And this is why it sometimes has caused problems as to well, what is the boundary between something being religion and going against a religion or being psychology? Hmm? And of course, it's a soft boundary, because what is the root meaning of the word psychology? Psyche means soul. The ology is the reasoning about the soul, the study of the soul. So psychology was originally spiritual. You know, it is a study of the soul, the human inner life. And it had been secularized, right? The spiritual has been taken out of psychology, and now they're bringing it back in. Okay, now they're bringing it back in. So this is it's huge, you know? so many best-selling books uh you know leading authors out there deepak chopra wayne dyer oprah on tv you know all eckhart tolle whoever whatever there's tons gazillion of them huge market is this personal growth era of spirituality psychology kind of blending together this is it this is the contemporary American spirituality. So much so that it even infiltrates traditional religion. So you'll see this in that, uh, what's his name, Joel Epstein? Oh, no, not Joel Epstein, I'm getting Jeremy, that other guy that died with the, his little um, paradise there. Um, yeah, Joel Olstein. Yeah, uh, you know, he, he, uh, you know, he's just <clears throat> taking in some of the personal growth stuff and Christianizing it a bit, you know. Um, anyway, so you'll have it even infiltrating uh, churches and stuff. Yeah, it's a lot of that going on out there. Anyway, I could babble on for hours on everything. <clears throat> So uh, a key figure here, yeah, is Abraham Maslow that I mentioned. There's just a picture of him. And, you know, you'll get this in classic mainstream psychology. They always bring Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, you know, which is pretty standard stuff. But he really wanted to focus on this higher self-actualization bit. And that's where the movement got its name. Actualizing your full potential is sort of the idea. But it does bring in and allow for the spiritual, okay, spirituality. That's what Maslow uh, allowed for. Okay. And transpersonal psychology is where it definitely claims that. It held that there is something within the self that transcends the personal. There's something bigger than you inside of here. Uh, something transcendent that's fundamentally spiritual and usually held to be divine. All right. Your higher self is usually what's called. Okay. 
Okay, and so a couple other names here that are important. I already mentioned Carl Jung, the founder of analytical psychology, okay? And what he's known as for is his whole theory of archetypes, various archetypes. It's really important stuff. And uh, the whole idea of a collective unconscious. And that's why in terms of world mythology, you know, the different teachings and experiences and stories that we find throughout the world is we find similar patterns, similar themes, similar imagery. And it's like there seems to be a larger ocean of consciousness that is unconscious to us largely, but is deep within our psyche that somehow connects us to each other, to all of life that is beyond time. And, uh, and that within that ocean of collective unconsciousness, there exist these patterns of energy that are called archetypes. And, um, and Campbell, Joseph Campbell, really works with that idea. And he wrote extensively in the area of mythology and, and myths. So he's got tons of books on that. And of course, it tied in with that comparative religion and worked with that whole idea. And he's the one that kind of packaged it in terms of the classic hero's journey that is now used all over the place. You know, even in the business world, it'll be used in all kinds of ways. And of course, it shows up in movies. You know, because movies and, and theater and stories that resonate, they, they capture something within the human psyche that is more primal and universal and draws us in. And so you have, you know, like Star Wars, you know, with um, Lucas, um, George Lucas, uh, classic Campbell Herney hero, hero's journey stuff. Um, you know, the call invitation to adventure, meeting a mentor, crossing a threshold of into this now dangerous territory where he has to face his demons and dragons and uh, Darth Vader or whatever his name was. Uh, I always forget Star Wars stuff, um, you know, and goes through all this. And then through that journey of dealing with these darker elements and realities, even within the self, what Jung would call the shadow within the self, right? That you learn and grow and there's a transformation. There's a death and rebirth and transformation. And you again gain gifts of that. And then you come back into the world and bring those gifts to others. That is the hero's journey, right? And anyway, in a bit of a nutshell, it's, it's used in marketing, uh, movies, good movies that really make a hit usually are working with this theme. It shows up all over the place, okay? And there are marketers, you know, in terms of internet marketing stuff, you know, they'll, they'll work with this too. Okay, anyways, I could babble on. But important ideas, important theories, that's all coming out of the human potential movement. So what have we seen so far? Just to kind of highlight you know, we've got here happening from the 50s through to the 70s, a lot is going on, right? All of this social activism going on for civil rights, uh, in terms of racial minorities, protesting the Vietnam War. Um, where do I have all my slides here? Then it goes, expands into like women's rights, gay rights, animal rights, all that sort of stuff, okay? Uh, then we have the whole psychedelic scene of altered states of consciousness just to blow your mind like, whoa, open you up to a whole nother dimension of reality. And it's fundamentally spiritual. So from that, we get then, you know, a receptivity to Eastern spirituality and mystical spirituality, a lot of Eastern teachers coming and that having its input in terms of spirituality. We have then the uh, whole uh, occult explosion exploring all these different aspects of reality right so there's all this spiritual exploration going on yet seemed to calling for social change and yet spiritual exploration that like wow and with that will lead to well i need healing the planet needs healing society needs healing healing becomes a big theme here i as an individual needs healing this is our society needs healing and transformation I need healing and transformation. The planet needs healing, okay? Uh, you get that kind of a key theme. And so the whole holistic health movement fits in with that, right? And then the human potential movement uh, deals with the psychology of, of the whole journey of growth and healing, right? And really applying that. But what you find, now we shall, uh, you know, I'm gonna do a little live thing on this with the whiteboard. But what you basically have happening here is a whole new paradigm and model is being proposed about the nature of the self and the nature of reality. And so that in terms of mainstream medicine, oh, there's nothing spiritual to you. To heal the body, that's all we do. The body is separate from mind and there is no such thing as spirit. Psychology, likewise, you know, the body and mind, there's no such thing as spirit, mind, oh, behaviorism, Freud, 
very limited view of the self. So then you've got these groups saying, no, 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 there's something spiritual to the self. We need a new model of the self here. One that includes the spiritual, that that is central to who we are. We need a new model of the self. Okay. And then with that is we need a new model of reality out there. That not only is there something spiritual to me, but there's something spiritual about life as a whole, the planet as a whole, that life itself is seen as a manifestation of the divine. Okay, that life is holy, life is sacred, and needs to be revered and respected. And we need to be in harmony with life, that divine life present everywhere and all that is. So it's a whole new model of reality that's being proposed here. And so as people are in all these movements and trends, all that was going on with the music and altered states and, and the activism and, and meditation and getting into yoga and all, you know, getting into all these philosophy and teachings and exploring, okay, uh, we'll find that at the end result is people found that they had a lot in common, all right, that that all their, that even though there's all these groups, it's like they formed a network where they could kind of interconnect because they shared certain common values, okay? And so let me just read what I got here. By the time we get to the late 70s, with all of these trends, movements, protests, call for social change, spiritual quests, call for healing, new ways of living, people, these, all these people who dabbled in all this, they found themselves as though they're belonging to a new tribe. <laughs> okay, they even call themselves a tribe, uh, you know, in terms of the B in, in uh, San Francisco there in 67. And uh, that they shared common values, common perspectives that set them apart from, you know, the traditional religionist on the one hand, in their traditional kind of religious view and perspective. And then also the traditional atheist materialist over here that just, just totally all religion was bunk. <laughs> okay, it had no use for any of that stuff. Okay, and so you, this is why I said in the beginning of this course class, we're dealing with the birthing of a new subculture in competition with two other subcultures, secular humanism, Okay, that has no use for religion or spirituality, that's strictly materialist in its conception of things, okay, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, traditional religionists, okay, I like to call them traditional religionists, where they hold to their religion, which is fine and dandy, you know, and all, you know again, there's quite a variety of things there, okay. But what often happens is their worldview isn't that different from the atheist next, next door. They hold the world view that this world is just dead matter. And where is God? Oh, up there in heaven somewhere. And what is there spiritual about me? What's spiritual about me is I got the soul inside that will someday get saved and get up there to heaven someday. Period. End of story. And so they're religionists only in that they add the extra belief or idea that mm, there is this being called God and there is this place called heaven and it's up there somewhere and there's something in me called a soul that will get there someday <laughs> and if you don't believe the way I do you won't get there you're going to go down there <laughs> um, I mean it's being simplistic but but just to kind of highlight the kind of orientation that you get there in terms of traditional religion right and then you got sort of the atheist secular humanist there and then these people here in the middle is like man they got a different perspective Okay, different perspective on the nature of reality, on what spirituality is really all about, uh, the nature of the self, how it all works. It's like it's a whole nother ballgame. Okay, and so that's why this whole movement of the new spirituality is also a new subculture. Okay, that's that's birth. It's not just a religious movement, a new religious movement, in which there's thousands of you know quirky little groups that show up. They have their little leader and they do their own little thing somewhere. It's like no, it's not just a new religious movement. We're talking here about a social cultural movement that's fundamentally spiritual at its core. Okay. And uh, it's much bigger than just some little new religious movement like Scientology with L. Ron Hubbard or something, okay? Uh, it's far more significant and important. And it's, um, yeah, tied in with big social shifts happening here in the 60s that, as I said in the beginning, is equivalent in impact, I think, as the Enlightenment of the 1700s in terms of the ramifications and the unfolding of this. There's a, there's a lot involved here. It's a big topic, okay? All right. So anyways, I think that's where I'll end at this point, hopefully.
Um, oh yeah, and, and again, I just want to highlight, people saw themselves here as being a part of this kind of thing as a movement. And that's where then the idea that we are all a part of a movement starts picking up in the 70s. And this is where Marilyn um, Ferguson, she wrote her book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, I think it was in 19... 70 or no it was published 1980 i think it was yeah after the 70s 1980 is when it came out like hey people you know what i think we're all a part of a movement that's happening <laughs> but the catch is nobody started this movement there's no one person that kind of kicked it off there's no one martin luther king that started this whole movement okay he just got it was the leader of the civil rights movement which is one little aspect of what's going on here so there's no one leader that starts the movement, no one organization that uh, is leading the way and running it or whatever. Uh, there's no one holy book that is sort of the code for what we believe and, and what we all follow and do. Okay, uh, I probably should stop the share here. So you don't have any of that. You don't have any one leader, one organization, one holy book, uh, one place, like, you know, I can look it up in the phone book, like, uh, you know, where's the local kind of new age church or whatever, or hippie church or something. You don't have that. Instead, you've got all kinds of teachers and groups and books and, and little mini networks and organizations, all kinds of them, but they all kind of intersect and link with each other because people find that even though I might really be into environmentalism over here and I'm really into maybe a bit of Buddhism over here or uh, just uh, uh, what, you know, some form of therapy over here, shamanic therapy or something, that we tend to have similar values. Okay, we have similar values, a similar perspective on reality, on life, on who we are, uh, how to live and be, okay? That's what happens here. And that's why it is this movement. And that's also what makes it difficult to teach about, uh, describe and explain because of its diversity, right? And it's very fluid. And there'll be fads uh, that come and go and then fizzle out and some new fad will come in and whatever. It's, it's rather faddish, okay? Um, yeah. So anyway, I think that's all I want to say at this point uh, on this and hopefully yeah it's of some use and some insight okay all right ciao for now